All right, let's turn to Hosea 10 this morning. We got two weeks left in Hosea. This morning we're looking at chapters 10 and 11, and then next week we will end the book looking at 12 through 14. So Hosea 10 and 11. And these two chapters, I think, are two of the chapters that hit the hardest in this book. Uh, These chapters hit hard because this is the Lord speaking through Hosea. And I think his goal in these two chapters is to show Israel the emotional love that he has for them. And it shouldn't surprise us that we have this section in the midst of the teaching on this emotional love. Because if we remember how Hosea begins, Hosea begins very emotional with God using Hosea's own family, his broken marriage with Gomer, his own children to illustrate the state of Israel and their relationship with God at this time. And so this is a point in the book where in the midst of the prophetic denunciation of Israel, God brings out his own emotions. So the Lord uses two illustrations, two images here to picture Israel and his love for Israel. And this is meant to show how devastating it was in the way that Israel had treated their God. So the first of the two illustrations is the image of a fa- of a farmer and his produce. The second image is of a father and his son. And so what we're learning here is that the Lord is not an emotionally detached God who is fine with his people and however they live, as long as they occasionally throw him some sacrifices every now and again to appease them. God is not okay with being one in a pantheon of gods. The Lord is the only creator God, and he's in a special covenant relationship with Israel, and he desires soul affection from his people. So God is like a farmer who works all year in his fields and then desires to receive the produce at harvest time. God is like a father who raises his son in wisdom and maturity and desires his son's affection and to see his son flourish in maturity. But Israel broke God's heart, if we can use that anthropomorphism for God, which I believe we can here. So what we're going to see is two pictures of how Israel failed the heart of God, and we start in verses 1 and 2 of Hosea 10. Israel is a luxuriant vine. He produces fruit for himself. The more his fruit, the more altars he made. The richer his lands, the better he made the sacred pillars. Their heart is faithless. Now they must bear their guilt. Now, let me just start by saying I really want to bang my head against the wall over this translation because Hosea did not write, Israel is a luxuriant vine. But the King James Bible and Robert Alter were the only two who gave the right translation. And that is, Hosea wrote that Israel is an empty vine, or you could say a blighted vine. Every other use of the word that's translated as luxuriant in the Hebrew Bible refers to emptiness or destruction. The translators only put luxurious in here because these verses speak of rich fruit that is coming into the land of Israel. But Hosea, to me, is clearly using irony here. That is, Israel is producing fruit. Israel is luxurious. But when God goes to harvest the fruit that he expects from the fruit of the vine, he finds emptiness. He finds nothing. So... The Lord, the keeper, goes to, pro, pro, goes to collect his produce which grew on those vines and find them empty because they have been pr- picked over by Israel's neighbors and because of their idolatry. So Israel, we need to remember, I've tried to mention this a couple of times, that during Hosea's day, Israel is very wealthy. They're as wealthy as they were as any period of the divided kingdom, but they are using their wealth for greater opportunities to dive into idolatry and sin. With their riches, they are making more altars to more false gods. They are building more pillars to honor more imaginary deities. Now let's note, because I think we need to get have an emotional feeling for these both of these chapters. They really pair well together nicely. Let's note how this would feel for a farmer. Could you imagine being a farmer and preparing the land for a vineyard? 
You, you till the ground, you, you plant your, your, um, your grape seeds, I guess. Do you plant seeds for grapes? I guess you do. And I think it takes a couple of years even for a vineyard to be productive. You go over all of that time watching it grow, protecting it from birds and bugs and predators. You put in that labor day after day, and then you even get to watch those little grapes begin to grow and get bigger and bigger on the vine and the bunches, and they get larger and larger. You put in all of that sweat, all of that hope, and then you go to harvest the grapes, and what do you find? Nothing. It is all picked over. I mean, talk about disheartening and soul-crushing, and that is the image and the emotions that God wants his people to have at the start of Hosea chapter 10. The point of these two chapters is that God wants Israel to understand his point of view, how he is viewing them as a nation. He wants them to know that the Assyrians are not going to be thrown back into the desert when they come to attack them because God is perfectly fine with how Israel has been living. But God will rightfully judge Israel because like a farmer who's come to pick over his field at harvest time, he has found Israel to be barren. And now we will see what the Lord will do following that empty harvest in the remainder of the chapter. So let's start at the Rest of verse 2 of chapter 10, and we'll go through verse 8. The Lord will break down their altars and destroy their sacred pillars. Surely now they will say, we have no king, for we do not revere the Lord. As for the king, what can he do for us? They speak mere words. With worthless oaths, they make covenants. And judgment sprouts like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. The inhabitants of the Samaria will fear for the calf of Beth Haven. Indeed, its people will mourn for it, and its idolatrous priests will cry over it, over its glory, since it has departed from it. The thing itself will be carried to Assyria as tribute to King Jareb. Ephraim will be seized with shame, and Israel will be ashamed of its own counsel. Samaria will be cut off like her king, like a stick on the surface of the water. Also, the high places of Avon. The sin of Israel will be destroyed. Thorn and thistle will grow on their altars. They will say to the mountains, Come for us! And to the hills, Fall on us! So we can divide God's judgment on Israel in Hosea 10 into two sections. Uh, Through verse 8, Hosea says, The emptiness and the blightness that has come upon Israel is caused by her idolatry. And then the next half, God's going to then label their sins against one another for the reason for their judgment. So first, God judges them for their idolatry. We see right out the beginning that the Lord says he's going to break down all those altars that that they built. He's going to tear down all those pillars that have been put up for other gods. And the result will be that Israel will basically say, okay, Lord, we give up. We've been trying to set up our own kings for all of these generations, but now we have no king. Israel will abandon their kingly lines, they will see their own demise, and they will also see that it's because they did not revere the Lord. And one thing we do need to note is that following the destruction of Israel at the hands of the Assyrians and the destruction of Judah at the hands of the Babylonians, the one major change amongst God's people is that they will become fiercely monotheistic. The destruction of Assyria followed by Babylon will teach Israel they are only to worship one God. And the thing we know about the Jewish people from that from these days on, even up to this very day, either the Jews have no gods, they deny it altogether, or they are fiercely religious in their worship of only one God. So that's the major change amongst the Jewish people as a whole as a result of the destruction of Assyria and Babylon is that they become thoroughly a monotheistic people. Uh, That's the consequences of their idolatry. 
And Hosea talks about how, how worthless they've been, how they've just been speaking these O's, but they haven't been following through on it. In other words, they've been promising things to God generation after generation, but they have not been fulfilling those promises that they have made to the Lord. And then in verses 5 and 6, Hosea really goes after the heart of Israel's idolatry. And the heart of Israel's idolatry from the very beginning of the divided kingdom until their final days is the cat calf of Beth Avon. Uh, the calf of Beth Avon is the calf that was built at the beginning of the reign of Jeroboam the first. And this was the one where they said, this calf is Yahweh. This calf is the one that delivered you from Egypt. And God said, I'm going to take that calf and I'm going to send it off to Assyria. That calf is going to become a tribute to King Jerob. And one note that we want to make is that Jerob is not a a name of, the king, of a king of Assyria, but Jerob is a Hebrew word that means greatness or one who contends or fights based upon the context. And you could say that titling the Assyrian kings great ones who fight and have contest against others, that falls well in line with all of the kings of Assyria at this time. So what Hosea is saying is that your golden calf's going to go away to a king who is great, who contends against them. And the tragedy is, is that Israel, after the golden calf is going to go on, they're going to mourn over this stupid piece of metal that has gone away. And in their mourning, Israel will be cut off from her kings. She'll be cut off from her high places. And the destruction of Assyria will be so brutal that at the end of verse 8, we're going to see that the Israelites will say to the mountains and the hills, fall on us, crush us. I would rather die quickly by having a mountain fall upon me than endure the terrible uh, wickedness of the Assyrian people. The Assyrians just didn't kill their enemies. The Assyrians humiliated and tortured their enemies. They were the first people to have the strategy of basically saying, we are going to so decimate and torture and humiliate the cities we conquer so that when we go to the next city, they're just going to say, hey, hey, uh, we, we, we're all right. We're, we, we don't want to fight you. And that was sort of Assyria's strategy. And it's so bad that what we see it in the middle of this chapter uh, reminds us directly of what people are going to say in the midst of the tribulation period. So we sort of see a, a beginning first fruits of how bad that end times will be through the destruction at the hands of the Assyria. And Israel endures all this for the sake of her idolatry, which she will leave after this time period. So, and one thing I want to make sure I note as well is that one thing we see in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all the minor prophets is that the paramount sin that's always top of the list for what Israel is judged is their idolatry, their worship of false gods. It's always that's number one, and then the way you treat each other is number two. Because I think you can make a good argument. The reason Israel's treating each other so bad is because they got the idolatry wrong in the first place, is that the one leads to the other. And in the second half of this chapter, we read about judgment that comes upon them due to the way that they treat one another. So that's starting in verse 9. For the days of Gibeah, from the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, O Israel. There they stand. Will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them in Gibeah? When it is my desire, I will chastise them. And the peoples will be gathered against them when they are bound for their double guilt. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh. But I will come over her fair neck with a yoke. I will harness Ephraim, Judah will plow, Jacob will harrow for himself. So with a view to righteousness, reap in accordance with kindness. Break up your foul ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes to rain righteousness on you. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies. Because you have trusted in your way, in your numerous warriors. Therefore, a tumult will arise among your people, and all your fortresses will be destroyed. As Shalman destroyed Beth Arbel on the day of battle, when mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. Thus it will be done to you at Bethel. Because of your great wickedness, at dawn the king of Israel will be completely cut off. 
Now, to understand the iniquity that God is judging here, we need to understand what Hosea means when he says, from the days of Gibeah. The days of Gibeah are a reference to a specific passage in the Old Testament. It is a reference to Judges chapter 19 uh, through 21. And if you remember anything about Judges 19 through 21, it is one of the most grotesque passages in all of the Bible. It is a story about homosexual depravity, brutal rape, murder, violent civil war, and then taking of wives by force. Everything in these three chapters in Judges, from beginning to end, is disgusting. And the central location for all of it was Gibeah. And Hosea, in I think what is kind of a shocking statement, says that the sins of Israel throughout the period of the divided nation are similar to the sins of Gibeah. That when the nations divided, that Israel went right back into those sins of Gibeah from the book of Judges and continued in them. So if you want to know why Israel's being judged so harshly, you need to go back and read the end of the book of Judges if you don't remember that story. And that's how they're living. And so it's not surprising that God will judge them the way that he does. It's really vile stuff. And then what we read, uh, starting in verse 11, when the Lord talks about harnessing up Israel and Judah and Ephraim uh, to work in his vineyard is that what God is saying here is that he wanted his people to be strong and productive in the land that he promised to them. He wanted them to sow righteousness. He wanted them to live with godliness. God wanted to reap this crop of people who were living in holiness and truth and righteousness and compassion and mercy. But instead of them plowing up righteousness, they plowed up wickedness and injustice. So God was looking for crops of righteousness and compassion. Uh, the two most common adjectives for the character of God in the way that God treats his people and in the way that God wants us to treat one another are righteousness and compassion. And that, but instead of producing that, what they have been sowing in the land of Israel is wickedness and injustice. So it's this idea, again, they're trying to have the, keep this farm image going in chapter 10. And God's image is, you know, I had you, Israel. I, I plowed up this beautiful promised land for you to live in righteousness and holiness, for you to care for the poor and the widow, for this to be the land that is a beacon on the hill that shows all of the world. The best way to live is God's way. But instead of walking in righteousness, God's people plowed the land and they didn't produce wonderful vineyards, fields of wheat. Instead, they produced thorns and thistles and poison. They had wickedness and injustice come up. A poisonous crop instead of a healthy and delicious one. So again, how devastating would it be to be a farmer and to put in all of that work in the initial growing season and, and to work so hard and to put all that effort in and then you go to harvest and, and it's not that you just don't have any crops at all, but the crops that you do have would cut you when you go to harvest them because of the thorns, would cause harm to your family if they went to eat them because they would be poisonous. God's saying, this is what Israel has been to me. And this is one of those places where I wish we still lived in an agrarian society because if we were all farmers and we were all growing our own food all year round, I'd, I'd go through this chapter and at the end, everybody would be like, amen. You know, that would be awful to work all year long and get nothing but thorns and poison at the end. We would know how terrible that is. Um, I mean, I guess probably for us, the closest equivalent would be like if you worked for two weeks for your employer. And then at the end of those two weeks, you pulled up your checking account looking for your direct deposit to get more money for your employer. And you see that instead of them directing deposit more money into your checking account, your employer actually took money out of your account for the time that you spent into them, uh, Lord is saying that is the image that he has here, something that is to be emotionally devastating. And then God shifts to another image that is to pair to this one, and that one is in Hosea 11, starting with verse 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. 
So I think chapter 11 is for those who aren't farmers, and God uses the familial language of a father and son. Uh, This verse draws us back to the Exodus in Egypt and also to the future with Jesus Christ and his fleeing to Egypt and then coming out of Egypt following his birth. And both the imagery of Israel and the Exodus and Jesus going into Egypt, both of these illustrate God's love for his son. The son Israel was whom God loved as a beloved child when he devastated Egypt through those plagues and compassionately brought them out of the promised land. And then even more so God's love for Jesus Christ to send him to this world to love us. And when his life was in grave jeopardy, at the very beginning from the power of King Herod, God sheltered Jesus in Egypt and then brought our Savior out of Egypt to be a light, specifically to these lands that we're talking about in the book of Hosea. So we're to read Hosea 11.1, and our primary emotional response to this should be, look at how much God loves his people. Look at how much God loves Israel. Look at the length that God went to bring them into the promised land, and look at how much God loves his son, Jesus Christ. Our God is a God of emotional love. Uh, It's who he is. It's the person that he is. He loves indeed. And we see how much God loves Israel. And then we see how Israel responded to God's love, starting in verse 2. The more they called them, and I guess I want to to make sure that we're, we're probably getting what's most likely being said here, so I'll explain this before I read even instead of just afterwards. The they is, is we're most likely the prophets that are sent to Israel. So the more they called them, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in thy arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of of a man, with bonds of love, and I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria. He will be their king because they refuse to return to me. The sword will whirl against their cities and will demolish their gate bars and consume them because of their counsels. So my people are bent on turning from me, though they call, though they call them to the, to the one on high, none at all exalts him. So the Lord not only wooed Israel to himself when he called them from Egypt, but after Israel's arrival in the promised land, God continued to call Israel to him. The testimony of the historical books in the Hebrew Bible are a testimony of God's faithfulness and perseverance to call Israel to himself generation after generation through prophet after prophet after prophet. If you think through the whole history of Israel, God sent them judges to turn them back to them. He sent them a wonderful good king in David to lead them. God loved Israel. God called Israel to him. But what did we see throughout Israel's history? The more God called them, the more they turned away from him. They ran away from the prophets. They persecuted them. They killed them. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and the false gods and going up to the high places. And all the while, what was God doing during those years for Israel? God was teaching Israel to walk as an independent nation. He was caring for them. He was healing them. He was protecting them from their invaders who would come from the east and the north in order to destroy them and belittle them. God would lead them with bonds of love. He lifted yokes of burden off of their shoulders, got to a point where Israel was receiving tribute from nations outside of her borders instead of sending tribute away. God had so much compassion on his people. Yet according to verse 7, no matter how much God loved Israel, Israel was bent on turning from their God. No matter how much he called, no matter how much he cared, they insisted on going their own way. And their own way was to say, yeah, God, we got this golden calf that we're going to say is you, 
and we're going to worship you amongst Baal and amongst Ashtaroth and amongst Dagon and all the other pagan gods of the land. So what was God going to do to his loving son? Well, we read here he's going to send them off to slavery. This time he will not send them to slavery in Egypt, where he originally called them out in love, but this time he will send them off to slavery in Assyria. And the reason they go to Assyria is simple, that during this time period, they had made alliances with the northern nations of Syria and Assyria. I really wish that they did not have those two names of Syria and Assyria. It's one of the things that drives me the most crazy, talking about those nations. Uh, But because of that, the Lord will send the king of Assyria, who at the time of the conflict will be Tiglath-Pileser III, and he will come over Israel, and the Lord's going to show them basically they're reaping what they sow. And that is when the Assyrians come into their land, they're not going to love Israel. They're not going to help them. They're not going to encourage them. They're not going to give them the grace and compassion that the Lord did. But the king of Assyria will starve them. He will kill them. And then he will send their survivors off to be slaves in his own land. So basically what the children of Israel did was they traded a loving, gracious father for a cruel, abusive father because they lusted after the power and the wealth of the man who had, who was cruel and powerful. They they wanted his power, they lusted after his wealth, and they went after that. But instead of getting his wealth and his power, all they got was his cruelty. And then chapter 11 ends by showing us that even though they will go into slavery during this time, God will not cease to be gracious to them, but God has a glorious end for his people. And now I'm going to read verses 8 through 11 of chapter 11. How can I give up, give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. I will not execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and not man the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, He will roar and His sons will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. First, I want to note that I'm not reading the last verse of this chapter because I think it actually belongs in the first verse of the next chapter. I think when they made up the chapter divisions of Hosea, they were one verse off. Uh, So we'll look at that next week in our conclusion to Hosea. But I believe that the end of Hosea 11 has a partial fulfillment in the first advent of Jesus Christ and will find its final fulfillment in the second advent of Jesus Christ. So I see the end of Hosea 11 all about Jesus and what he's going to do for Israel. God tells Israel that he cannot give them up. He cannot surrender them because he made that unbreakable covenant with Abram regarding his descendants. And God keeps all of his promises. So God tells Hosea here that his compassions are kindled. And that is the father is like the son, Jesus Christ, If we remember in the story of the feeding of the 5,000s, we sort of have similar uh, language that Jesus' compassion uh, is stirred up over the crowd because they had nowhere to go and no food to eat. And so the Lord has the tame type of stirring over his own son Israel. He loves his son. He loves his vineyard. And he is passionate that he will burn with love over them in the end and not with wrath and with anger. And the interesting thing is that normally when we think of somebody burning, uh, we think of somebody burning with anger. We just talked about that last week, about how Israel was like a burnt pancake because they burned in their sin. But what the Lord says now is that he will have the opposite of the people of Israel and that in when the Lord burns, the Lord will burn for love. The Lord will burn for grace and compassion. Since God is not like a, a, a man... He will not fly off the handle in a knee-jerk reaction. He will not cast Israel away forever in wrath and judgment. 
But instead, God gives us an opposite picture. And uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite imagery in the Bible. Uh, this is the imagery that is uh, part of the basis for C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. And that is, God will roar like a lion. And instead of his people running away from him in fear, God's roaring will have people coming back to him in trembling in order to find security and protection in the fear of the Lord. Uh, This little section reminds me a little bit of uh, numerous psalms that we have about the importance of fearing God and that bringing us security and protection. An example is... Oh, I thought I had it up here. Is uh, I thought I had it in the PowerPoint, but I don't. An example is Psalm thirty-one, nineteen. Psalm thirty-one, nineteen says, "How great is your goodness, which you have stowed up for those who fear you." So we have God's goodness for those who fear Him, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. So God is good to those who fear Him. It is those who fear God who find refuge in Him. The Bible has a consistent message that those who fear the Lord are those who love the Lord. Those who are at peace with God are those who fear and tremble in God's presence. To me, it is almost as if we can't fully understand the depth of God's love and care and compassion for us unless we see God rightly. And to see God rightly is to see God as powerful, as ferocious in might, with the power of the roar of a lion. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is capable of striking down any foe, any adversary. God is the God of power. And if we're truly going to love the Lord and understand His love for us, we need to fear the Lord. And this section ends with God saying, and I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. This is again very, very familial, uh, very family type language. Uh, this is the type of language where you can picture a child uh, being put to bed by his mother at the end of the day. And so God is saying, I'm going to come to you like a lion. I'm going to roar. You're going to come trembling before me because of my greatness and my my awesome majesty. But then once we get into God's presence, and then once we're under the shadow of his protection, then the image shifts a little bit from from a lion who who can fight off any adversary in our life to now of the image of a tender, compassionate mother putting her baby and her child to bed. And I don't want anybody to misunderstand me that I I think it's all garbage, this idea of God being a female deity um, that's becoming way too prevalent. But if we want to understand God's character fully, we need to understand that God is both like the majestic, powerful lion, and God is also like the tender, compassionate mother in the way that she cares for her children. And I think that's a really strong image that God is trying to bring across to Israel, that God is really like the ideal parent. He has the strength and the courage of the father who you know you better not cross him or the discipline will be harsh. Uh, And also you can come and, and lean and rest upon him when you are scared. But God also has the compassion and the love that we expect to find from our mother when we come and lean and cry upon her in our need. And so what we're seeing here is how God will love Israel to the very end, and we won't see the fulfillment of this love in the end until Christ returns for the second time for that second advent and actually builds those houses for Israel to dwell in that they might know his grace and his glory before him. So God is trying to show Israel that these next generations are going to be trying. They're going to be heartbreaking. They're going to be as difficult as they can be, but they're going to be just like they deserve this judgment upon them. But this does not mean that the Lord is done with Israel, who he's called out of Egypt, but the Lord will continue to love them. The Lord will continue to love Israel. And then we'll see the final fulfillment of God's love for Israel when the lion comes back to earth 
and in his power and in his might sets up a kingdom for Israel in their promised land. 